I want to start off with trying to determine what is a mountain. And this is kind of quite an awkward thing because I remember whenever I um, used to work over in, in Scotland and, and people in Scotland would used to say that oh, there's, no, there's no mountains over in your part of the world. And then Americans would say the same thing to Scottish people, like, oh, we've got the Rockies, like yours, yours are just hills. And there is actually a kind of rough definition of what a mountain is in a British and Irish context. So it's determined as um, anywhere which is roughly above 600 metres above sea level. So that does narrow it down within um, our part of the world. So realistically, this little map here, so you can see that's a picture of the Mourns. Um, on the right-hand side, that's a picture in the Sparrens. And um, there, there are very distinct clusters of where those areas that are over 600 metres are. So you can see the Mourns down in South Down there, the Sparrens, main Sparrens Ridge there in kind of mid Tyrone and um, kind of south of, of Derry. Then um, we have... Uh, one kind of little isolated dot away down in the southwest there, southwest of Enniskillen and Kulka Mountain. And then um, this this map also includes um, a number of points out in Donegal there where there are quite a lot of mountains. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, and kind of because it is quite difficult to really put a definition on what a mountain is, I'm going to include other areas in that as well. Um, so I'm just going to give you a bit of a run through of the mountains that are near to our part of the world and kind of um, fit into our, our landscape in Northern Ireland and this part of Ulster. So start off, um, the, probably the most well-known one and the one that probably most people are most familiar with is the Mourns. So it's the highest concentration of, of um, a mountains um, in Northern Ireland and the most over that 600 metre mark. You can see there, that's the Eastern Mourns, that's Donard away right in the back in the middle and Berna um, on the left there with the Tours and Sleeve Lamagan and stuff. So this it's probably our most iconic landscape, but it's it's by no means our only one. Um, so one that means a lot to me, I worked on this part of the world for a good number of years, Kulka Mountain, away down in southwest Fermanagh there. Um, it is 666 metres, very bad, unlucky number to be that height, but it is. Um, and yeah, it's very isolated down in that part of the um, part of Northern Ireland, but actually it's put, because it's part of a, a range which is more continuous with... Um, County Cavan and County Leitrim, um, and it kind of just stretches right into Northern Ireland and that part of the country. Um, then we have the Sperrins, which is the other big cluster of, of big hills. Um, Sol and Dart there would be the two, the two of the biggest ones, and they're in around the 700 metre mark. Very, very different landscape to that of the Mourns. Mourns more dramatic and steep-sided, very rocky. The Sperrins is very much more sort of rounded and, and um, undulating, um, much more blanket bog in that part of the world than there is in the Mourns. And then one of it that wasn't on that map is the Antrim Hills. And um, the Antrim Hills doesn't have any of these areas that are over that 600 metre mark, but it also has areas that are called Monte and Heath. So it's kind of in the name there already that it is kind of mountains. So I'm, I'm throwing this in because they, they are really mountains in, in an ordinary Irish context. They are just as, as much mountains as any of those other areas that I've already described. So I'm not going to leave them out. Um, that's Troston. They're the highest of the of the Antrim Hills there, just in the distance on the right hand side. And I just wanted to include this because it's it's a part of um of Ireland that we're very, very familiar with in Northern Ireland very regularly. Um and, and that's Donegal. And this is Derry Vay. So um this is looking from Aragal, if anybody knows it. Um looking northwards ish um toward Loch Alton. And um there's some big quite dramatic mountains in that part of Donegal. Um, and it's a very, very interesting place because it's it's so northerly, westerly, um, remote and kind of rugged. Um, and it holds host to quite a lot of um, the species that I'm going to talk about tonight. So that gives you a bit of an idea of where the mountains are in our part of, part of the world. Um, and I'm going to now move on to talking about the different species that we get. So I'm going to start off with plants and then I'm going to talk about birds where there's quite a lot to go through. And then I'm going to move on to some mini beasts and then some other things before finishing up. So I wanted to start off with talking about montane plants. And that word montane um, is just a, a word which is often thrown in front of particularly plants, um, which uh, is is basically just means plants that we find in, in mountain-like environments um, and very often actually we find them in different scenarios um, because of the different underlying geology uh, that they quite prefer. But I want to start off with top left there. This is 
this is actually a tree. In fact, the two pictures on the left hand side are both trees. Um, juniper is a, a plant that it become has become very very rare um, in Northern Ireland. It does still exist in some scenarios on um, Kulka in particular and in some areas of the Mourns. If anybody knows, familiar with the area called the Castles in the Mourns, kind of right at the very head of the Anlong Valley. And juniper is a tree, but in, in an Irish context, it very much never looks like a tree. Um, it, the berries of which which come from it, uh, we, we historically use to produce gin. Um, but if you go over to Scotland, Juniper actually grows like a proper tree. It grows upright and, and off the ground and can be the height as, you know, taller than the mere you. But in Ireland, it rarely ever grows past this creeping form. And it's very often because most of our landscapes are either quite quite heavily grazed or they're very exposed. They're out in the west or up high, very high winds, very cold. And juniper grows in this particular form. Um, which allows it to basically spread out and not be tackled by those really horrible conditions. Um, but because it's very low lying, then it's very easily grazed by by livestock. And um, this is probably one of the things that's knocked it back in many years. But you can still find it in those areas, as I say. So have a look around in that part of the castles in the morns. Or on Kulka is a great place to find it. Actually, even some of the more low lying areas of Kulka, um, you'll find this in the rocky sort of um, slopes and, and cliff sort of areas um, where it likes to grow. And then the bottom left is our smallest tree. And uh, there isn't anything in here for scale, but dwarf birch, it is a birch tree, um, but it will never really grow more than about sort of between five and 10 centimetres off the ground. Um, and those weird red things are the fruiting bodies of the tree, um, but it has these tiny little round leaves. And uh, we only find it in a handful of places now. So um, you can come across it on the tops of places like Sleeve Comeda or Sleeve Donard, um, or again on the top of Coca, some areas of the Sperrins, um, and some areas in North Antrim. But you really need to be doing your best to try and find it. It, it usually is growing in and amongst heather and kind of in and amongst rocky crevices and stuff where it can manage to get a foothold. And again, it's not particularly tolerant of, of any kind of levels of grazing. So, um, But it's an amazing wee plant, really, really hardy. It'll survive in the kind of harshest environment. So right in the tops of those very, very exposed peaks, very shallow soils, really low temperatures. And it's a survivor, you know, it's still hanging on in those places. And on the right hand side, then we've got the club mosses. So the club mosses are a group of plants which um, are unbelievably old. These guys as a lineage actually predate the existence of the dinosaurs. So they've been around for hundreds of millions of years. And these examples are, are some of the few ones that we have um, still remaining um, in this part of the world. So the most common of which is the fur club moss, which is in the, the top right there. And this actually you will come across quite regularly. Uh, again, some of the tops of our highest mountains. Um, and places like Donard, great place to find it. Um, but any of the high morns, really, Berna, um, Sleeve Lamigan, you'll definitely find it on the tops of those. Coke is a brilliant place to find it. Some of the areas in the Antrim Hills there, I was up on Sleeve and an E the other day and found good good areas of it. Um, but on the bottom right is, is a different type of club moss called Alpine club moss, which is much, much rarer. And there's only really a couple of examples of it surviving now today. Um, uh, and again, tops of the highest bits of the Mourns and on Kulka Mountain, where actually the fellow who recorded it hasn't found it again for about 20 years, so it could well be gone. Um, but there's a, well, I'll talk about it in a wee second as well, but there's a very, very sort of good um, theme that runs through a lot. Well, I say it's not good, it's quite bad. Theme that runs through a lot of these plants in particular that I'll touch on in relation to climate change. So these are some of the prettier ones then that we find. Um, so starry saxifrage on the top left hand corner here. This loves like north facing, very, very wet um, cliff edges where there's constantly drips and everything coming through. And it flowers in around April, May time, but it's a very, very difficult plant to find unless you really know where to go. Um, and some of the areas can be quite dangerous, but it's a beautiful, tiny little thing. It's barely bigger than, you know, half a pencil um, in, in height. And um, usually it's in these really difficult to reach places. Um, Moss campion. And purple saxifrage, the one on the bottom left and then the, the image on the right, very easily confused, as you can see from those images. Um, but they are completely different plants. Um, but in Northern Ireland, they're actually both only found in one remaining place. And it's one area that I actually haven't mentioned yet, and that's Benevena. So Benevena 
many people will know, very iconic landmark and piece of the landscape in the northwest. It's really like the kind of the, the most northerly edge of the upland range of the Sperrins. If you think of the Sperrins kind of running from all the way in West Tyrone, almost right through to Donegal, and then they go in this big arc, sweeping gradually more northwards until they get to Benevena, up on that northerly most point. And in Benevena, we have a very particular kind of set of circumstances. It faces north, and it's quite high, um, and it's very far north. So it's it's cold for a lot of the year. It will get snow cover, which will last in little pockets and crevices um, for longer periods of the year. And this is the only place that purple saxifrage and moss campion still survive in Northern Ireland. Um, they're actually in good numbers in, the, in that particular site, but otherwhere else in the, anywhere else in the country, they have long since disappeared. Um, and I'll touch, again, I'll touch on that in a wee minute. Um, and the final one in the middle there is a really weird one. Floydberry is actually a member of the same family as the bramble. So um, blackberries, as you can see, berry there, looks very, very similar. Um, the only thing is that this example will only grow at very high altitudes. Um, and this, this plant is now only found in one single location in the whole of the island of Ireland. Um, in the middle of the Sperrins, on one of the mountains, I don't even know exactly where it is, only those who really need to know where it is know the exact location. There is one single plant which exists still of this particular species. Um, and very, very sadly, they believe that it's actually a male and um, it can't actually reproduce. So um, even from seed, it wouldn't be able to grow anymore. So you would have to bring in other individuals in order to actually propagate it or anything. So it's one of those kind of sad stories that it's the last of a dying breed, but it is still there. Those that, that do know where to go have gone up in recent years and found it again, and it is still holding on. But um, it's unlikely that it's going to be spreading anywhere anytime soon. Um, so those are some of the more colourful alpine or montane plants um, that you can come across in Northern Ireland. Starry saxifrage, um, just, just to mention, you can't you can get it in the morns, some areas of the Antrim Hills. Coca is one of the best places that you can find it in those north-facing um, wet kind of uh, scree slopes and cliffs where there's that constant flow of water which is coming down those cliff faces. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of maps here. So the one on the left is for purple saxifrage, the one on the right is for cloudberry. So as I said, cloudberry only existing record now is in the middle of the Sperrins for the whole of Ireland. Purple saxifrage is still found in a couple of areas um, in the Republic of Ireland, a couple of records in Donegal and way out in the west. And then a good number of records actually in and around the kind of Sligo Leitrim area. And that's because these alpine plants, these montane plants, very often actually have, as well as a relation with altitude and, and height, um, they also have a relationship with um, geology. So very often actually we get alpine plants on limestone areas or areas that have a lot of limestone in them even at lower altitudes than what they would survive at where limestone doesn't exist. So that sligo leitrim area is a bit of an anomaly there. Um, it's kind of a bit like the Burren to a degree, um, but more upland, higher ground. Um, but the reason I wanted to just show these maps is that there's a very common theme with montane plants. They, um, they were the first groups of plants that colonized Ireland after the Ice Age ended. So as you imagine the ice retreating northwards and you had this bare, barren rock roughly in around sort of 13,000 years ago. Um, the first things that would have started to colonize that bare, barren landscape were things like the club mosses. And then other types of mosses and bryophytes would have gradually started to colonize and they would have built up a soil. And then you would have had other flowering plants and trees like dwarf birch and juniper and the, the purple saxifrages and that sort of thing that would have then gradually started to colonize. But as things got slightly warmer, then these things would have gradually been pushed higher uphill because as you as you increase in altitude, then temperature drops. Usually about every 100 metres, then you lose about a degree of, of temperature. So these things have been pushed further and further up the hill. And as temperatures continue to rise due to climate change, then these things are going to get pushed to the point where they have nowhere, af nowhere left to go. So um, it's very possible that in 20, 30 years' time, we may well not have any of these alpine plants anymore, which is a real shame, um, but they are still holding on for what it's worth at the minute. Um, so we just need to keep monitoring and make sure they're still there. And if if anything changes, then fingers crossed, they'll stay where they are. 
Um, but it's just a, a bit of a, a link there um, to show you exactly what the future might hold for some of these these plants in particular. And I should note actually that it's it's not just true for the plants, it's also true for some of the other species that I'm going to touch on here as well. So that gives you a flavour of some of the plants um, that we find in, in our mountain environments. Um, and I'm going to move now on to the birds. So um, one of the first ones I wanted to touch on was the peregrine falcon. So peregrines are a bit of a success story, actually, because they they were very, very heavily um, persecuted uh, many years ago, and they also suffered very badly from a particular pesticide called DDT, which thinned their eggshells and basically made them really infertile. Um, and ever since that was uh, made illegal um, and they've stopped being persecuted as much, their numbers have gone really, really in the right direction now. Um, and they would have been known as birds of cliff faces and, and mountain areas, anywhere where you've got like a big sheer kind of rocky slope with ledges on it that they would like to nest on. That's the kind of place you would think of for peregrines. But they've actually then started to move into cities, anywhere where you get big tall stone buildings. They, they love it as well. But they're an amazing bird, have this really dramatic cry that you can hear sometimes if you're um if you're out in the hills i remember the last time actually i heard one was walking up towards blue lock um heading towards the the call in between binion and lamigan and um up on the left hand side there's some big slabs there um and i i think that there may well have been peregrines have nested there in the past but they definitely breed in the area and um you can hear it crying as it flies back and forth. And it's this really dramatic noise. Um, actually reminds me, I think they've used it in like old Disney films. Um, I think it's one of the noises that you actually get in like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. I could be wrong. Somebody can either concur or tell me that I'm absolutely off my rocker there. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, as many people probably aware, one of the fastest animals on the planet. They they dive bomb their victims. So they fly way away up in, into the sky and then they, they go in a stoop all the way down really high speed and actually it's not that well known but um peregrines rather than grabbing on to to prey like a a, a a rock dove or something in the sky um they actually fold up their talons and they effectively punch them so uh, they do have very powerful talons talons but actually it's they've 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 come to realize that it's more effective at immobilizing their prey if they literally fly into them at 150 200 miles an hour and punch them with a closed fist um, and this usually completely just knocks them out of the sky. Um, but an amazing bird. Anywhere where you're in the hills and you get those big sort of scree or cliff kind of areas, um, you, you have a reasonable chance of coming across one these days. Um, so one definitely well worth keeping an eye out for. Um, another one which is very commonly found in exactly the same kind of places is the raven. Um, so ravens are really interesting birds. Um, and... Probably one of the more readily seen big birds that you will come across in, in our mountains. So anywhere from the Mourns, the Antrim Hills, the Sparrens, Coca, wherever you are, you've quite a good chance of coming across ravens. You can usually tell the difference between them and, say, a carrion crow, usually because in this part of the world we have hooded crows um, so or, or grey crows. So usually um, if you see a big black bird um, in in the mountain areas, then it's, it's probably going to be a raven. They have a, a wedge-shaped tail. Um, but they, they also have very distinctive noises. So if you hear a crow calling and then a raven calling, a raven is a much more like guttural kind of deep um, tone to it. But they, they're, they're incredibly intelligent. Some people reckon that they have the intelligence of, of you know, young children um, and they play with each other. They do these mad things on really windy days whenever you would be walking up in the hills and you'll see ravens kind of like dive bombing at each other or they fly away up into the sky and then they tumble down. They sort of fly downwards and they roll over and do barrel rolls and flips and stuff. And people have tried to work out exactly where this is, but there's no, it doesn't, it doesn't come across that there's like a display element to it, you know, that they're trying to attract mates or anything. A lot of people think that they're just having the crack. You know, they just think, well, sure, it's, you know, it's it's windy. I'm going to fly around and do some flips here, you know. Um, but they're amazing birds. They actually are breeding. They breed much earlier than a lot of other birds um, in our upland areas. So um, ravens tend to actually start nesting in now in February time. And that's because actually they um, they they can find food more readily because they're 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 big scavengers. They can find food more readily in the, in the winter time, in the poor um, months than a lot of other birds can. So um, ravens tend to actually get going next month. Um, so they're they're quite a nice bird to start to sort of follow going through that nesting period um, earlier than a lot of the other ones. But they're amazing. 
if you get a, if you get a view of one up close, you realise how big they are. They're huge, actually. They're roughly about the same size as a buzzard, which a lot of people don't realise. One of the birds then that you're probably a little less likely to see, um, but very lucky if you do come across them, is a hen harrier. So hen harriers um, are they're they're raptors. They're birds of prey that resemble the female anyway. Would maybe resemble a bit like a buzzard. Um, to some degree, but they have very distinctive um, flights. So they like areas where there's lots of tall heather. That's what they use to nest in. Um, the best places in Northern Ireland to actually see them are probably the Antrim Hills area and um, Sleeve Bay, um, which isn't an area that I've kind of mentioned. It's it's um, a, a kind of an upland area in, in south, south Fermanagh and um, south and east Fermanagh and, and um, south Tyrone, uh, heading into Monaghan. Um, and they, they're they amazing birds. They're really, really beautiful. Um, they they quarter the land, um, kind of flying very, very low, just above the heather, and they zigzag back and forth, this quartering kind of flight pattern. And basically, they, they're ambush hunters. So if a small bird like a meadow pipit or a skylark kind of just erupts or happens to be looking the other way while it's sitting on top of a stem of heather, um, then, then a hen harrier will just nab it. It'll get it right there and then. Um, but they do this amazing thing called sky dancing. Um, so coming into not far away from now, kind of February, March time, um, the male and the female. So the, the, the picture on the right hand side is a, is a male, uh, this gray blue with the black wing tips. And then almost actually from a distance looks almost white. And then on the left hand side, um, also known as a ring tail, the, the female is this kind of more barred um, cream and brown kind of color. Um, but they, they do this dance in early spring where um, the male and the female kind of fly fly up very, very high and they will then kind of shadow each other and they'll flip around and they do this thing called a, f a food pass where the male will actually get, um, in, in a lot of places over in England, it would be things like voles, but maybe it might be a meadow pipit in this part of the world. It would catch a meadow pipit and then it would fly up and they actually fly right sort of over the top of one another and then the one that's on the bottom completely flips around and the one that's on the top drops the food into the talons of the one that's flying underneath. And it's an amazing thing to do. Like I couldn't even dream of throwing something to somebody in like across the room, let alone dropping something or throwing something to somebody who's flying, you know, 10 feet below me. Um, so it's an incredible thing to see. Um, they, they are very heavily persecuted birds in places like England and Scotland. We don't have quite the same level of persecution um, over here, they're, they're persecuted over there largely because of um, grouse um, sort of management um, in that part of the world. And they see them as a threat to grouse because we don't have much in that way of management here. It isn't quite as bad, but they do still get persecuted to some degree, um, even though they pose absolutely no threat to man or beast. Um, these guys survive mainly on tiny little birds that are no bigger than a, you know, a robin or a starling. Um but they're amazing to see. Usually, as I say, if you're out in the hills somewhere out in like Slevenora or Troston or something like that in the Andrum Hills, and you see a bird that from a distance almost looks like a seagull, um, and you can't quite tell why it's flying so low against the ground and kind of moving back and forth, good chance it's probably a male hen harrier. Um, and they're yeah, they're just phenomenal birds to see. If you if you ever get a decent view of them, one of you really, really lucky. Um but yeah, one of my favorites. And then another great one. Um there's a lot of raptors in this kind of thing. There's a lot of a lot of birds of prey actually, which um, shows you that uh, it's a it's a challenging place to survive in the mountains if you're a bird, if you're a wee bird. There's far too many things that can try and eat you. Um, but this is a tiny one. So the merlin is our smallest breeding bird of prey in Northern Ireland. Um, it's it's really really tiny. It's it's probably maybe smaller than a um, than a wood pigeon, a good bit smaller than a wood pigeon. Um, it's probably somewhere in between a blackbird and a, and a pigeon. Um, so they're totally wee birds. Um, and they, actually good places to see them again, Antrim Hills, uh, West Romana, kind of Kulka area, um, and some areas of the Sparrows as well. And it's actually quite good to see them in the wintertime. Um, if you're ever up walking in the hills in the, in the wintertime, in the bad weather at times, um, you can see Merlins. And if you see a tiny little, um, very fast flying bird with very sharp sort of wings, um, flying quarter and back and forth, there's a good chance that it's Merlin. Or if you're really lucky, you can you can come across one perched on a fence post or something and get a great look at it. But um, they're a tiny little falcon, same family as the peregrine, but 
much much smaller and they would survive by eating very small birds so they would go after they would probably eat meadow pipits and stuff as well um uh, but they they actually nest on the ground uh, hen harriers do as well so although they survive and hunt mainly in the kind of the mountain environments anywhere there was big expanses of heather and um, both birds actually nest and breed create their nests right on the ground which is another reason why they suffer quite badly um, through persecution and from predation because they're much easier to eat if you're a fox or a badger or something. Um, it's a lot easier to come across a merlin or a hen harrier's nest than it is a peregrine's. And the last one I wanted to touch on is one that is a very big sort of question mark for the future. So golden eagle is about as archetypal bird of the mountains that you could ever think of. So even even like across the globe um it is the the bird of the mountains it's iconic you find it all the way from here basically right across um the the sort of temperate um latitude through northern europe all the way through russia even right around to north america and um, so it's found all over the place um we lost our last breeding golden eagles in northern ireland i think it was about 1962 and they were breeding on Fairhead, way up in North Antrim, um, east of Ballycastle there. And actually, those birds were um, very, fairly regularly going across the Mulligan Tire over to Scotland to feed. Um, but they, they would historically have bred on places very much like that. So anywhere where you get big cliffs with ledges on them, very similar to peregrines or ravens, they would nest in very, very similar places. Um, but they have now long since gone, unfortunately. Um, and they were completely um, eradicated from the island of Ireland. Um, um, I don't know whether it was not long after that. That might well have been the last breeding pair of golden eagles in Ireland. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but then uh, the Golden Eagle Trust actually started a project to reintroduce them. And they decided to do it in Donegal. And that area of Derry Bay um, or Glen Bay National Park was the area that they decided to reintroduce them. So... Um, that part of the world is probably one of the best places to go to try and find or spot eagles. But actually, so a lot of people have said that they, they haven't done as well in that part of Donegal, but other areas where a few individuals have, have ventured out to, they've done slightly better. So the, the best views of a golden eagle I've ever actually got um, were in the blue stacks in Donegal, just not far across the border um, from West Tyrone. And um, there was a there was a number of ravens and stuff that were calling at something, and there was this pitiful little cry. Golden eagles have the worst call for an eagle ever. It's the least eagle like noise you could ever come across. It's this pitiful little kind of weep. Um, and I heard this thing, and I honestly thought that it was like a a, a waiter. I thought it was like a plover or something. And then this thing just erupted over the edge of the hill, and it was gigantic. And I knew just then that it had to be an eagle. Um, on the right hand side, just for comparison, that is a raven. And that is a golden eagle. That's a picture that um, I took on Mull um, when one flew right over the top of us. And it was amazing to see just to be able to get that scale, that comparison there. They are gigantic birds. So um, a buzzard um, is is absolutely, a buzzard is roughly about the same size as a raven. And golden eagles have a wingspan of somewhere in around the two meter mark. Um, so they're, they're huge. And they will eat things like hares, grouse, um, they will scaven on, scavenge on lots of stuff. They will eat dead sheep. They will eat dead deer. Um, they're perfectly happy to eat that kind of stuff. But the, historically, they would have been really heavily persecuted. So they would have been poisoned, shot until they basically disappeared. We do actually have, I mean, even though they, they don't breed in Northern Ireland anymore, you do still have a reasonable chance on occasion of seeing them, particularly in the early part of the migration season. So, um in around kind of March, April time, and then later in the year, in around um, September, October, when birds are on passage, we very regularly get birds from Scotland who venture over to particularly the Antrim Hills. So if you're if you're ever out walking that part of the world um, and you see a huge bird that you think, like maybe from a distance, oh, it's maybe a buzzard, you know, but um, give it another look. It, it could well be a golden eagle. It's it, They've been seen there fairly regularly. I had a colleague not that long ago who walked up onto the top of Kulka onto the plateau there and whenever she, she got right up onto the top then a golden eagle just lifted off and flew up and spiralled up into the air. So they are around. It's it's not outside the realm's possibility to come across one. So just keep your eyes peeled. Um, and then some not birds of prey. 
Um, we have golden plover, one of my favourites. And the golden plover is a little wading bird, which still now it only really breeds in in um, Pulka and uh, Pedago in Northern Mana, but it's a bird of the uplands. So it breeds in these kind of very big upland flat expanses of blanket bog. And then actually in the winter time, you can come across them in some of the tops of the highest mountains. So the the plateau on the top of Kulka or in the tops of the Sperrins or in the tops of the Antrim Hills, you can see these little birds um, flying around. They don't have that quite this stark sort of black bib in the wintertime. That's their summer plumage. Um, but my colleague um, actually told me, uh, have you ever seen that picture of the, the golden plover chick beside the moss? And I was like, no. And then he, he, he told me to Google it. And then I found this image and I thought that is insane. So obviously on the right hand side, sure you can work out that is the golden plover chick on the left hand side that is woolly fringe moss which is a is a moss which we very very commonly get on some of our highest mountains um and it carpets the landscape so you can imagine if you were a predator and you were you know scanning around and you just glanced and saw those two things beside each other that chick is going to blend in there pretty well so it just shows you how well adapted these guys are for breeding in these kind of upland mountain environments and it's amazing to see um and then a few other ones to finish off the birds. So snow bunting is not a bird that we get breeding in Northern Ireland, but in the winter time, actually, I've come across them quite a few times now in some of the highest hills. So particularly top of Kilka or top of the Sperrins, even again on top of Donard, um, you can come across these little birds in this kind of plumage. They um they actually breed, the only place they breed in the UK is in the tops of the Cairngorms. They usually breed in places like northern Scandinavia. But on occasion, we get these few little small flocks that decide to hang around over the wintertime on the tops of um, some of our highest mountains. And it's incredible because these things are tiny. You know, they're totally little birds about the size of a sparrow, but they seem to be perfectly at home in, you know, minus 10, uh, 30 mile an hour winds um, on the tops of some of our highest mountains. And then... Ring ousels are an amazing bird. They're kind of like the mountain blackbird. And we used to get these birds breeding here until about the 1950s, 1960s. And the Moran Mountains used to be a real stronghold. Um, but the problem is that they, they really like long, sort of mature heather and bracken. And um, ever since sheep farming became sort of big scale and we started to get a lot of European subsidies, um, our, our heather is kind of died back a bit and and the ring ousel in not just the Mourns but in plenty of other areas across Ireland as a whole has largely disappeared so now we really only get it in um, parts of Donegal and uh, parts of, in Kerry but um, it's really a specialist of the high mountains if you were in the 1950s for example walking up the top of Donard you could well have heard a, a ring ousel um, singing away and it's not outside the realms of possibility that we could get them back again it'd be amazing to see um you're out walking into Donegal Hills and you see a blackbird at, you know, 650 metres altitude, there's a good chance that it's actually a ring ousel and not a blackbird, um, or it is a very lost blackbird. Uh, speaking of which, the last one that I wanted to touch on in terms of birds was the wren, because I don't think I've ever been the top of a hill in Ireland and I haven't come across a wren. These wee things just live everywhere. They will find some wee nook or cranny in a rock somewhere that they will nest and they will just creep around. doesn't matter whether it's a you know, 820 metres above sea level, they'll be there. They're they're not adapted to the hills. They're just adapted to everywhere. Um, just ubiquitous. A couple of mountain mini beasts. So the one on the left, believe it or not, is a, a pretty common moth, actually, in some of our upland areas and some of our mountains. Um, anywhere from the Mourns, Antrim Hills, um, Sperrins, you have a good chance of coming across the emperor moth in the springtime. So April... Um, is the best month to come across them. But this this one here is a male. The female is a grayer kind of color. And um, if you want to get a good picture of these guys or get a good view of them, you need to get out in the early morning. So if you walk out in a nice clear day, but like at dawn before they've had a chance to warm up, then these guys climb to the tops of the, the sort of sprigs of heather and they will open up their wings to bass to warm up. But if you come across them at like 12 o'clock or one in the afternoon, you will not see this. You'll just see a bright orange blur that flies past you at about 50 mile an hour. Um, so if you want to get a good view of them, they're the only um, member of the silk worm family 
Um, the, the the same group of, of moths that actually produce silk in East Asia. Um, this is the only member of that same family that we get here. Um, but they're such a striking moth. And a much rarer but much more drab kind of um, species um, that we get in some parts of the, the mountains, as it's named, the Grey Mountain Carpet. It, it loves to bask on big open expanses of rock. And it's it's really under-recorded because as you can imagine, if you were to see one of these or not see one of these sitting on a piece of granite in the morns, um, it would blend in pretty well. Um, but this is a specialist of the mountains. Um, it only survives in these kind of upland areas. Um, uh, if you can spot one, then fair play. I've only ever seen two, I think, in my life. Um, they are quite rare, but they're just also massively under-recorded. A couple of other ones then, a um, couple of beetles, because actually one strange thing is that um, there's a good number of beetles that are real specialists in some of our real high mountain environments. So Carabus glabratus, these unfortunately don't have English names. If anybody wants to come up with one, then you're welcome to have a go. Um, this is probably one of our biggest beetles. It's probably like a couple of inches long. It's a sort of one that, you know, you wouldn't really be that keen on picking up because it might actually give you a bit of a nip. Um, it's a real specialist of, of upland kind of bogs and mountains. Um, and you might be lucky on occasion if you're sitting down having your lunch, um, this thing might wander out in between the heather stems um, and try and steal your sandwich. And then a much more colourful example is this Carabas nightens, which I've never seen. Katie has seen. Um, and it, it's just the most striking beetle, believe it or not. This is something that we get here. Um, it is quite rare, but um, you can come across it quite readily in a number of different mountain environments. Um, and both of these these beetles there are kind of like the tiny lions of the of the mountain environments. They wander around um, looking for unsuspecting smaller bugs and beetles in order to prey on. Um, but fair play to anybody that comes across Carabas nightens because it's it's amazing. And nearly there then lizards and hares. Irish hares are endemic to the island of Ireland, as is um, shown by the name, um, and they. They kind of can be found from anywhere all the way down from the lowlands right away up to the highest mountains. So again, I'm thinking of I've seen Irish hares way up in the tops of the Sperrins at like 700 metres, top of Coca, 650 metres, and they're perfectly happy up there. Um, it's actually said that in some occasions, um, the, the ones, the individuals that live quite high up, um, if they go through a real cold spell, they actually do start to go white. So Irish hares are more closely related to the mountain hares that they get over in Scotland than the brown hare that they get in England. Um, and the mountain hare does actually go fully white in the wintertime. The Irish hare is a bit of an in-between. It will kind of get patchy white. Um, but yeah, a lot of local people have told me in the past that if it gets really cold, some of them have gone completely white in the past. Amazing animal to see if you can get a good glimpse of them again early morning best time to spot them if you're up in the hills and our only reptile Ireland's only um, reptile is the common lizard so uh, this guy best time to come across them is again early morning before the sun is properly out when these guys come out to bask so if you're walking anywhere morning's a great place to come across them um, where you've got, you know, rocky outcrops or boulders or anything, and these guys will wander out early in the morning to to bask and warm up before they start to wander around and feed on the insects in and around the nooks and crannies and the heather and everything. Um, but they're brilliant to see if you can get if you can get a good close up look at them. They're so colourful, actually. Some individuals they they vary massively in colour, so you get some that are really quite brown, and you know, others are very gold, and some that are even then like really green, particularly in the height of the summertime. Um, they're amazingly striking. Um, so there's a couple of other examples. So guys, that is everything for me. I sort of, I'm not going to lie, I was going to say I kept the time there, but I definitely ran over. Um, so thank you very, very much. I hope that you find that interesting. Um, and what we can do now before, actually I finish, I've been told I can't forget to, to give some um, promo to the other events. So this is, as I mentioned, one of the online winter talks. Um, there are a whole host of other winter talks um, that are going to be coming online then um, in the in the next few weeks. So uh, what about the Red Squirrel and Pine Martin survey in 2022, the results um, colleague Ross is going to be talking about. Katie, who is on here, actually is going to then be talking about Northern Ireland's Isles. Um, great talk. I'm really much looking forward to about the two lives of our Brent geese. Um, unexpected wing visitors and peculiar peatland plants, um, bug munchers, the bone breakers. Um, so quite a lot to look forward to then. So if anybody's interested in those, just go on to the to the website there and then register. So 
that is everything from me. So I'm going to stop sharing. And then I'm going to go through the chat and have a look at any of the questions. And then if anybody else has any other questions, then feel free to throw them into the chat. Um, so there is Aidan saying, spot a peregrines in Belfast near the harbour. Yeah, actually um, near Belfast Y. Actually not a bad place to come across them. They they will venture over. There's um, birds that will come over from uh, Cave Hill direction and they will venture right across from the other side of the lock um, or up near Redburn direction as well. Um, and they love hunting above those kind of shoreline areas in Belfast Lock, taking off waders. Um, James says, on Winterwatch a few weeks ago, they shared new, re new research using super slow-mo cameras. It was suggested that peregrines hunt over water. They don't punch, but impale their prey with their rear talons as they don't want to get their feathers wet. Oh, wow. That's awesome. I missed that one. Um, that's really cool. God, that's crazy, though, that they actually, like, impale them. Jesus, that's risky. I would have thought that's like, you know, that's that's the equivalent of like running at like 50 miles an hour into somebody with your fingers out. Obviously, granted, they have much sharper fingernails than we do, but that's crazy. Um, and Ruth says, do we know the extent of the damage to the wildfire, the damage to wildlife in the Mourns fires and the recovery? So the, the National Trust is actually doing lots of really good research on the fire, particularly that happened on Donard. So from what I'm aware, there was a good several hundred acres that was badly burnt um, in that fire a couple of years ago. Um, it was a real shame. And they, because of the time of the year that it happened, um, which is becoming much more common these days, um, it happened in the spring, which meant that there was lots of um, ground nests and birds that were, were killed. And um, their nests were destroyed. So lots of lizards um, and and particularly insect larvae that were completely destroyed. Um, big problem with fires um, these days is that they happen at that time of year. Historically, a lot of fires in our mountain areas would have happened during the winter time. So a lot of people traditionally would have burned about this time of year. You would have had a cold burn in February. Um, uh, and that time of year it wouldn't really had it would have would have still had a, a, a negative impact and releases lots of carbon into the atmosphere. But in terms of its impact on on the wildlife, it wasn't anywhere near as severe as it is now when we tend to get fires in like April, May time, which is really destructive. Um, recovery is happening, though. But what they want to try and monitor is, is it the recovery that they want or the species that are coming back, the ones that they think should be there, or is it a different kind of recovery? So I know they're getting a lot of purple moorgrass coming back, which isn't what they want, really. They want more heather coming back. So it's one to keep an eye on. Um, but the National Trust are doing a lot of good work on that, which is good. Um, do we get marsh harriers, Trevor has asked? Yes. Um, not um in uh, the mountain parts of the world but definitely best place if you want to see marsh harriers is um portmore lock uh, rspb reserve anywhere kind of around loch nay to be honest particularly in the winter time is a really good time of the year to look out for marsh harriers and um, they as far as i'm aware unless anybody's keeping it very quiet they don't breed uh, in northern ireland yet but that could well change um they they're definitely frequenting. I think at least every year now there is a marsh harrier that's floating around um, the Portmore kind of Loch Ness basin part of the world. So, you know, just wait. Could well be in the near future that they would decide to breed. Um, very I'm similar. That, mar sorry, oh. that marsh harrier's been there in the last couple of weeks, I think. Oh, has it? Um, someone okay. was telling me. So, yeah. And apparently there's two. So oh. I don't know if it's two males, two females, a male and a female, but there's been two seen at once. Quite recently. Oh, wow. That's oh, exciting. there you go. That's very good. Yeah. So definitely, if you want to try and see one, then get down to Portmore and get into the hide, looking out over the reed beds. Um, they're a lovely bird, look very similar to a hen harrier, but slightly different plumage. And they hunt, obviously, in very different kind of environments. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely a good, good place to go down and try and kind of get them. Uh, Jamie's asking here, will starry saxophage grow in gardens? I mean, I'm definitely not condoning wandering up onto the slopes of Kilka and, and pulling um, starry saxifrage out and putting it in your garden. But I do think it is one of those species that has now become quite readily used as a rockery plant, as a lot of other alpines are. So I think there are actually examples, moss saxifrage, or sorry, moss, campion and purple saxifrage 
are definitely both plants which you can now buy garden varieties of out of the garden center. I think starry saxifrage might also be one. Um, so yeah, they grow very well in rockeries. Very nice actually to have native versions of you know plants um, growing in your garden, which um, only exist in these kind of harsh environments uh, in the wild. Um, but definitely don't go out and take them from there. Um, da, da, da. Aaron has said, I thought ravens weren't so common here. Is there a good number of them now? I would love to see one. They have actually become um, a lot more common. Um, so one of the craziest places that I've ever actually seen a raven is um, uh, in, in actually, well, in Katie's back garden um, in a house she lived in before. Um, but they, uh, they, they actually nest in Castle Park in Bangor. Um, so they, they have become a lot more common um, in the past sort of 10 years. Um, but if you go anywhere in the uplands these days, um, particularly in the wintertime, you have a good chance of spotting a raven. So anywhere in the Mourns, the Antrim Hills, um, the Sperrins, you're going to have a reasonable chance of coming across one. If you, you go onto the RSPB website and and type in the, the look for a raven, they have they have a... Um, an MP3 of the of the call, um, where you can play the audio of the call, um, and it is quite a distinctive, very as I said, guttural kind of raspy call. Um, if you got that in your head and then go out and, and listen for it, um, you can definitely come across them. Um, but they're amazing birds. Extra points to anybody that can tell me what the uh, the word for a group of ravens is. Um, it's one of my favourites. Anne is asking here, are hill sheep still subsidised post-Brexit? Can of worms there, eh? Um, yes, they are. Um, they are still subsidised, not in the same way that way they were back in, say, the 80s, whenever you were subsidised, you were, you were given um, subsidies per head of, of livestock. Um, that's long since gone. Um, that was why overgrazing and everything was so bad back in, in that period. But we now just have the single farm payment. Um, and so it's not subsidised quite in the same way, um, but it is still subsidised. So there's still a lot of, of hill sheep grazing that goes on at levels that, from a wildlife perspective, probably isn't particularly sustainable. Um, but that might change. There is a lot of talk about what agricultural policy will look like um, in a number of years, um, whenever kind of Brexit has gone through its many motions um, and agri-environment changes um so we'll, we'll have to wait and see there um then wilson says ravens seem too much more common outside high mountains in recent years um yes they, yeah they definitely are yeah they're way like I, I, i've walked uh the dog around the house here and i've seen ravens there was ravens in the churchyard not that long ago they have they've really started to do very well Um, they're a very adaptable bird really adaptable bird um James says, what method would you suggest for trying to learn identifying plant species in general? Living in Kerry, but find it difficult to remember their characteristics. Oh, flip me, Kerry is a good place to be learning. Um, one thing I would say, James, is there is very little good substitutes for going out with somebody that knows what they're looking at. So um, the BSBI is actually a great thing to join. Um, they, uh, that's the... the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, um, and they have lots of local groups, and they do lots of outings and stuff. And honestly, see if you spend a day with with any one of them, um, you will learn so much. There are a number of good um, books out there, though, as well, and websites. So, um, uh, one good book that I would use is the the Plants and Habitats of of, of Britain and Ireland by Ben Averis, which is really good. Um, and it not only gives you plants, um, individual plants, but it also gives you like habitats and stuff as well. Um, so you can try and get a bit better mind around them um, where you're likely to find certain plants. Um, and the other thing, Wildflowers of Ireland is actually a very good website and it breaks down plants and flowers by colour and time of year, which is actually a very handy tool whenever you, you like take a photograph of something and then want to try and work out what it is. Um, and then another thing which is now becoming really quite cool is um, if you have an iPhone or Google Lens, um, it's getting ridiculous now how good phones are um, at identifying things. Now, it's not foolproof by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but now if you take a photograph with an iPhone, then the little information 
thing that comes up in the bottom of the screen, um, it'll have a star beside it if it's taken of like a plant or something. If you click on that and you're connected to the internet, then um, it, you can search and it will actually give an idea of what that plant might be. And a lot of occasions when I've done it recently, it has been correct. So have a go with that as well. But I, again, another good thing, things like Facebook groups. Um, I know that we have a great one for butterflies and moths um, on the, the BCNI group on Facebook, but there is, again, BSBI groups on Facebook. Great for posting photographs of stuff that you're not 100% sure about and other people um, will give you a hand. So there's um, there's quite a few um, different avenues out there to have a go at, James. But honestly, um, if you can chat to somebody or find somebody that's willing to go out and have a wander around with you that knows what they're what they're looking at, that's the best way to do it. Um, Paul says, been both hen and marsh harrier simultaneously at Portmore a few weeks ago. There you go. Um, yeah, that's another good website, actually, for people to keep an eye on if they're looking for some of these birds is NI Birds. Um, Irina says, a kindness of ravens. Uh, David Saunders has got it there. It is an unkindness of ravens, which is one of the best I've ever heard. Um, a murder of crows and an unkindness of ravens. Robbie Marsh has taken a picture here or sent a picture in of a caterpillar, which is one of the tussock moths, or it might be a vapor. I'd need to look it up again. Um, but that's a heck of a one. I could find out what that is. Um, do, do, do. Robbie says, What type? I think try looking for tussock moth caterpillar on Google, Robbie, um, or vaporer moth caterpillar on Google. And it, it's definitely a tussock. I know that for sure. Um, well, you know what? Actually, it could be a knockgrass. Oh, jeez. You're sending me down a minefield here, Robbie. Um, no, it's not a knockgrass. It's one of the tussocks. One of the tussocks. That's where to start. I need Andy Crory on here. He's the man that knows all the moths. Um, Grant. Okay, folks, does anybody else have any other questions before we finish up? If not, then um, thank you very much, everybody, for, for coming along. I hope you find it interesting. Um, and as I said before, the when you once you close um, Zoom, then there will be a wee feedback thing which will pop up. If you could just take a wee minute just to complete that, we'd really appreciate it. Um, and thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And again, everybody who's a member, thank you very much. We really we we couldn't survive if it wasn't for everybody's support as members. So um, thanks again. <laughs>